So a bit of a backstory. So Spotify has been using open source since its very beginning. Like it, was, it was founded based on establishing an engineering team first and then figuring out like how to do this whole music thing afterwards. Um, so naturally open source was also just part of what we adopted and used from the beginning. And also just as natural engineers started publishing code as open source as part of that process. So there was no, there was no could you say, company decision to focus on open source or any like central governance. It was just something that organically happened. It was part of this autonomous engineering culture that Spotify has. Uh, if you looked into like working models for engineering cultures over the last uh, five years, you've probably seen this Spotify model of autonomy and tribes and squads and so on. And that's very much how we practice things as well. So engineers are empowered to do what they feel is right and what they're passionate about. Um, but still, after, after 10 years, we are seeing, you could say, challenges with this kind of thing at scale, especially around open source projects. Um, because we see a struggle with actually prioritizing our own projects. We see that we can't keep engaged with our own code long term. And we also sometimes have a even a challenge rationalizing why did we even do this? Like why did we even open source this? We don't care about this open source project and no one else actually does either. Um, but we still decided to do it because no one really asked questions about what is the value of doing so. So in the sense, um, inside of the way we work inside of Spotify is we have a strong set of principles and ways of working for normal work like projects, but we never applied those to open source. So it's kind of a gap. We see open source as this like passion-driven kind of perk for employees, whereas our internal projects is very much, we are guided by very specific principles of what makes sense to our customers and also at the same time learn and measure and adapt, but we never applied, applied those principles to open source. So um, after 10 years of doing that, we have kind of come to the conclusion that passion for open source is, is, is great, um, but in the end, Open source work is essentially just work. You still need those mechanisms to decide if as a piece of work for an employee or an engineer, does it actually make sense to do for the business? Otherwise, you end up with these hobby projects um, where you forget the whole thing about value and goals and dedicating resources and so on, and more is just a hobby. And so it's not, uh, we don't think it's just a challenge for Spotify. We think it's a structural problem in the ecosystem. And also, uh, we think this kind of thinking about open source as a hobby or passion driven thing is also something that, that has a negative impact on sustainability and diversity in the ecosystem as well. Um, Jim also talked about this in the keynote this morning, um, which is great. I think it's great that they, they actually start talking about how do we do this. Um, also, I think he's sometimes he's wrong when he says that money doesn't make a difference. Because for a lot of projects out there, money is actually equal to time. We'll get into that a little bit more. So, um, so what I'll do here in this presentation, I'll try to share the findings and our principles and the concrete changes we're doing right now to, to try to fix some of these problems for ourselves. Um, and also give you a bit more background why we feel this is also a way to address sustainability and diversity in the ecosystem as, at large. Um, before I worked at Spotify, I worked at a different company in Europe called Solando on their open source and security topics. And before that, I spent 10 years in, in an open source software company um, with a um, 300, 400,000 developer uh, community behind it. So I've tried to be on both sides, both uh, as an open source consu consumer and also as an open source vendor. So um, the agenda, we would just look at three metrics we kind of looked at to kind of figure out where we were and kind of understood the problem. <laughs> Um, then the, the three different kind of beliefs or, or principles that's guiding us going forward. And then three specific things you're doing now. We don't see that as the, the end, end game, but we see it as, as three concrete things you could start doing now. So, the metrics. Um, so this is, this is a key metric for us because when we looked at our commit data and looked at the employees as the, inside of the company, so uh, for our employees, we don't, we don't measure uh, community members commits, like externals, because we don't know where they are in the world, so it's very hard to actually tell what their working hours are. But for our employees, and we knowing their working hours, we can see that over half of it is outside working hours. Um, you could say for a company, that's of course great, because people work for you for free. So from a, a commercial perspective, that's probably fine, but it does end up being a problem in regards to sustainability and burnout. People essentially have two jobs. They have their actual job at Spotify, and then they have 
that open source project they maintain on our behalf. It's also a metric that's on par with the industry. About half of all commits on open source project at large is done outside working hours or on weekends. Um, that's from a 2014 study. There hasn't been any newer since. Maybe this has changed, but I highly doubt it. Um, also, if we look at our dependencies, um, we have very little influence on our dependencies. We don't have any kind of user upstream strategy. What do we de decide to engage in and why? Uh, when we actually pull in like bigger infrastructure components, um, we have historically not actually had any sort of collaboration with that upstream dependency. And so that also gives us limited involvement and limited influence over the dependencies we so hardly depend on. When we talk about supporting these dependencies, we had not had a program for doing that, neither financially or non-financial support of these dependencies. So we didn't really know if we had an important thing in our stack and how this was supported and how we ensured that it stayed alive so we could safely depend on it. So looking at our own projects, um, we have about 125 projects in our GitHub repository organization that we deem somewhat active. 116 of these do not live up to like a basic quality baseline that we've set for our projects. So that means that they have open security <coughs> vulnerabilities. They have pull requests that haven't been addressed for more than three months. They have issues that has not been addressed for six months. Uh, and some of them haven't had, had commits within 12 months, so they are practically not active. Um, if we zoom out a little bit, um, this is a chart that outlines number of active repositories, or, or public and not archive repositories on GitHub, uh, compared to activity over time. <coughs> so you can see the number of repositories just keep growing, and the, the activity line just stays somewhat flat. We don't have the same kind of growth compared to the amount of, of code we actually maintain. Uh, you can see there's a bit of a, of a change around January 2020 which is actually more to do with the different security tooling that started to become a thing, like Dependabot. So it's more like these up, uh, automated updates on our repositories, and I can see this trend going up a little bit. So um, a summary just on where we are is that we have generally a quality and longevity challenge with our own projects. Um, we also see that we, uh, when we actually open source a project, <coughs> it gets harder for ourselves to actually use it, and that's a tooling problem. Like we can't use the same testing and build system and so on. So once we open source things, it actually becomes less popular and satisfied for us to use. Um, but anyway, uh, these projects, it has a negative impact on the experience for contributors. It's uh, generally a security problem for everyone who depends on our project that we don't maintain them properly or we abandon them. Um, but I think the most important thing for us actually is that we cannot tell the difference between success or failure. Like we can pour in engineering hours into a project and at some point because we didn't give the engineer uh, dedicated hours or support in the community support, marketing support, financial support, this engineer will walk away and do something else with his time because he's had to do it in after hours or weekends. So a promising project might end up being abandoned. At the same time, we might have a very dedicated engineer putting hundreds of hours into something that makes no difference to the world. No one cares. It only cares for him, really. Um, and that's just as much of a problem. So we as an organization need to be better at telling a difference between what is actually a valuable project to us and a not valuable project to us. And, and the metrics show that we are clearly failing at that. So with that, um, three different beliefs that, that is guiding us going forward and some metrics to just kind of explain how we got to that. So, um, Tidelift and Black Dog has done some surveys about maintainers. And this is like the long tail maintainers, not the, not the Kubernetes or Linux maintainers. As we heard in the keynote today, they are, they're pretty good with like time and money. Um, but generally speaking, half of all maintainers don't feel compensated money-wise for their, their work. 45% uh, of them feel stressed because they have to maintain this project outside of work. And also, the general positive changes in regards to security and compliance is gonna lead to more demands on maintainers going forward. We see all these different things about <coughs> test bombs, securing the, the supply chain and so on, and these are gonna impact maintainers. Also further down the stack, we might start with the Alpha Omega projects now, but further down the stack, we have the, the color of JS projects and the little tiny utility projects that, that is not part of this and won't get resources to it, but they will still end up being impacted by this. Um, and for us, why we care about this is that if we depend on an abandoned uh, project, that is an enormous risk for us. 
if we have something that we reference 2,000 times inside of our landscape and the maintainer decides to say, I am not gonna do this anymore, uh, or just silently walks away, then, then we are depending on dead code. Uh, and we don't wanna do it. That's, uh, that's why we, we have a dependency to build it internally. So for us, funding a project is actually the cheapest risk reduction method we can think of. Uh, if we can give a maintainer 5,000 euros to work on something, uh, without any strings attached, I'm not, we're not paying to add features. We're paying just to keep maintaining, uh, add security updates and so on. Um, that is the cheapest way for us uh, because it would be so much more expensive for us to update all applications to a different alternative or find out how to fork it and so on than just paying this person to do it. So this is, this is the first principle, and this also applies for our artists on the platform. Well, we believe creators should be paid for their work, and that also includes open source creators. Um, we can't pay every creator in the world. We don't have the money for that, uh, but we do believe we should pay the creators we, we depend on. So the next one, next principle, uh, if we look at, you could say, the diversity of commits in the ecosystem, around 9, 10% of all commits uh, on open source projects are from um, female contributors. Uh, there are different studies, but it varies between like 5 to 12%, I think that's a max. At the same time, we also have this metric of half of all open source work happens outside working hours or on weekends. Um, and then the last one, if you, if you look at a job ad for any kind of tech company in the world, they would most likely have a desired skill around contributing and maintaining open source. So that means that we have, we have, we have built up an ecosystem that is for a very specific kind of person. You, you do this outside working hours, you do this in your weekends. There's a very low diversity in the ecosystem and same time it's like a highly valuable skill. Um, so our guidance is we don't think that it should be just for people with evenings and weekends to do open source. Also, we don't think it should only be people who are paid by tech companies. We need to find a better way of doing this. Uh, also because what you learn in open source are great skills for career progression. This can bring you forward from being a junior engineer to a mid-level senior engineer. The things you learn in open source projects are valuable for your career. And if we gatekeep that and say you can only do it after hours on weekends, or we don't pay people to do it, uh, then that's a very specific kind of people. Um, and so for us as a tech employer, we have an obligation to improve that diversity. We need to ensure that our employees have dedicated working hours when they work on our behalf. So it's not just for the 20 something uh, dude who likes to do JavaScript on the weekend, but it's also for people who are above 40 and have a family or for people who have sick relatives or for people who have a, a larger degree of, of home, like um, housework to do. Um, so we can enable anyone to do this because this is an important skill for your career to develop. So um, that is the second belief. We believe that all employees should be given support and work time to do meaningful open source on our behalf. So the last one, um, when we look at the ecosystem at large, uh, when we talk about successes, a lot of the time we talk about an open source company became a success because a bigger tech company bought it. Um, so we can see Red Hat being bought by IBM, nothing against Red Hat, it's, uh, IBM is fine. Um, or we see that open source libraries getting repackaged into cloud offerings, or the open source projects who have received a lot of funding are pressured to make enough money, so they relicense under a like, non-open source license, so they kind of force their customer to pay. Um, so we believe that we should, we should try to decentralize the commercial success in the ecosystem. There should be more small vendors you shouldn't be, it shouldn't be required that you are like an open source unicorn. There should be more room for like open source small businesses. There should also be, just be room for maintainers who are fully paid to do it. Um, and also for us, why we care about this is because if we can actually see a dependency that has a commercial strategy, so they can pay their bills, they can pay their engineers, that is actually for us a positive sign on longevity uh, so that we can keep depending largely reduces the risk of depending on something if they actually have a commercial strategy. And we will gladly pay them a license fee if they have a commercial offering because that also means that we get a more stable product to depend on. It reduces the risk for us. Um, so this is a very long belief, but we do believe that the ecosystem is better off as a whole with more independent commercialization. We should move from this 
very uh, lovely picture of everything is free, uh, but to actually start having a more normal way of charging money for what you do. The, the old fashioned model of I provide you value, you pay me, still works. And it is actually a, a fairly decent way of actually making sure that people are paid. Uh, but it's a hard thing to do in the open source communities right now because you also have these like larger tech companies like Google, Facebook, and so on, who actually offer everything for free because they have other income uh, channels as well. So it's hard to be a, a, a small uh, open source vendor out there because you don't have you don't have a search engine to pay for your bills. Um, but we do we do believe that we do need to remove the stigma of making money for open source consumers. So um, also, uh, the principle is the right thing to do. We don't really believe in that because it has a tendency of, of these, like the right thing to do kind of thing, have a tendency of going away on, on once you kind of hit like more economic on certain times. You can see this in these times now. Uh, and also, as Jim mentioned in the keynote, that, that um, companies have a harder time justifying you know, investing into the commons. So. So three things we're doing now about this. Um, so regarding by the beliefs, and these beliefs have led to like three concrete things we're doing. Um, first of all, this is a very much like an internal facing thing, is that we want to move open source, you can say up or down, to be on equal terms with any other kind of work inside the organization. Um, if we look at it again, as I talked about in the beginning, we have operating principles that helps us define work in any other kind of, uh, in the organization. These are the five principles. We also have like a larger framework, but it's around like focus, optimization, differentiation, synchronization, but also the last one is like learning and adapting. Um, um, so these principles drive our normal work and this should also drive our open source work because it's not really any different. Um, so for us it's about elevating open source work and looking at impact and purpose when we do these projects. So where we want to be is we want to ensure that open source work is prioritized on equal terms as core business work. And this is where you zoom into when a team make prioritization decisions. They likely have a feature inside our service that powers one of our applications or music streaming or whatever, but they also have an open source, open source project they own. At some point, this team needs to make prioritization for their, their backlog and say, we need to add this thing here for, um, that's a weird power, so I'm just ignore that. Um, we need to prioritize updating our open source project or we need to add feature X to the, um, to the mobile app, whatever. They need to have a framework where they can actually compare those two things on equal importance, saying we are actually doing this open source project because it helps us hire for the team or it's a good career development for the junior developer who's owning it or it's actually important for the company to own this specific niche in the, in the landscape. It, or it could be any other thing, but they need to know why they're doing it. So a team needs to be dedicated to actually, um, here we go. So um, the team needs to be committed to doing this and also they actually need to set goals in their, in their key results. Like when we are going forward as a team, what is it that we actually want to achieve with this open source project? And we've seen in, in Spotify teams, at least there's a tendency to just like, yeah, like open source is just an ad hoc thing. We'll do it every once in a while when we have time for it. And it's not really driven by a roadmap or concrete um, uh, goals. Any other kind of work inside Spotify is driven by a roadmap and concrete goals. So why isn't open source? We, we believe that it should be the same. Um, so this essentially goes, boils down to that a team before they actually release or start like a larger upstream contribution is that they actually have an idea of the purpose and the value of why they're doing this. And it's not just driven by an individual, but it's actually driven by a team decision. Oh, this, this makes sense for us as a team. It's not just driven by a random person over here who just thinks this is fun. It's actually a team decision because in the end you have a budget of hours per team you can use per week for things. Uh, and an open source project, if it's important enough to the team, you can set aside hours, work hours to do this. Another thing we've done is we've uh, added metrics for all our projects. Um, so these four, it's hard to see with the screen, but that's like four boxes at the top. This is the four, four important things for our teams to actually understand. When they own a project, these are the metrics that we, we care about. Um, so of course you have like the spectrum of contributors, you have like security, you have responsiveness on PRs and issues, and then you have how much of this work happens within working hours. So we now have a metric inside the company that we measure all the time saying, you have a project here, 
Uh, but you actually only spend 10% of your working hours on this. So this is clearly something that you like weekends or evenings. Maybe it should just be a private project. Maybe it shouldn't be a Spotify one. Or maybe you can actually ensure that you dedicate resources for it so you can do it in your own way. So for that, yeah, uh, prioritization and team ownership is the only way for us to deliver long-term and quality for that. Uh, with ownership, there's also a responsibility to actually measure whether we adapt. It hasn't happened yet, but we have a sense that once we get the teams to go into this mindset of actually measuring the impact and learning from it, they've also at some point come to the conclusion that, oh, we should actually probably just archive this, or we should add another engineer because we can see there's actually traction in that. <coughs> um, and again, like in, in the matter of priority, it is business first, teams, and then individual needs. Whereas before, it had kind of been the other way around. It's an individual with a passion who has done something. Uh, we do want to have the perspective that in the end, it's the business who are investing into this. So you should also understand how it actually benefits the business. OK, so funding. Um, so I think, like largely, when we talk about the, the left side, like the, the more important, more critical projects, they are generally paid by their employer to do open source work. Um, but then you have the long term, uh, long tail, and that's where money equals time because they don't have a salary from the employer, employer to actually do that kind of work. It is something they do outside of work or they do it as part of being a freelancer or a small business. Uh, and they do need to find the money to actually justify the time investment. So for us, we still see that money does matter for open source projects, especially when we look at our dependencies. Um, we see there is a clear need to fund them. We also f completely filter out stuff that comes from Google and Facebook and other like large companies because we know they have paid staff to actually do that. Um, so last spring we started an initiative of experimenting with funding projects because we honestly don't know if it works. Like I don't think anyone has actually seen like a metric that says, oh, this actually improves the thing. So we started out by uh, dedicating 100,000 euros. Uh, and we also decided to be public with the number because we need to start somewhere. We, ex we see this as an experiment. So again, we, we try things out, we learn from it, and then we adapt. Um, our focus was very much to have eight to 10 recipients of this. So we actually give them a fairly large sum of money. Again, a small project, but giving them a large sum of money. Uh, nominations came from our employees and also from our dependency graph. So it's like a bit of a quality metric and a, and a quanti quantity metric. Um, and again, we had a focus on independent projects, actively maintained and also aligned with our company values. Do they have a code of conduct and so on? And we wanted to do it as a yearly thing. We didn't want to like spread it out over a year. Also, the reason why we wanted it as a yearly thing is that we wanted to have like a, you can say a point in time when we say, okay, we gave these projects money at this month in time. Let's, six months for them, let's look back and see if it actually has an intangible impact on the metrics we care about. So we funded uh, projects doesn't really matter what it is, but maybe you recognize some of the, the logos. I think what is problematic for us is that we, we know that these are good targets to fund. We know they, they are represented across our landscape. We know if any of these things went away, we would be in, in, in problems. Um, however, what we don't know is we don't know if there's actually the best ones because it's very hard to actually decide if a music streaming uh, encoding library uh, how important is that compared to a JavaScript testing library? Um, and we have both a, a music uh, encoding codec, a codec here and a, a testing library. So we don't be, how do you determine that? Like engineers can't compare those things across an organization. You can't decide what is the best ones. Uh, we know these are good. So, um, but it's a thing we need to, we need forward, we need to, to find a way of, of figuring that out. Um, one way we're doing it is that we are repurposing this idea of the FOSS fund to actually drive it into the team budgets. So we are enabling teams to actually just take from their own team budget and pay an open source dependency. They don't need to pay for a specific feature. They don't need to have like a, a support contract. They're just paying them for their already done work in that project. Um, and that getting to that point is hard. Like convincing procurement, legal, and all those things to, to pay for nothing is hard. Um, it is not a normal thing that companies pay for nothing. Um, so, but it, it helps us actually move that criticality understanding into the teams, so the teams actually make a decision. The team that actually depend on that audio encoding uh, codec, they understand how critical it is, and they can actually make a better decision than we can like broadly for the entire company. 
So, already said this, we're running out of time, so we're just going to skip this. So the last point we are doing now is we are focusing on commercialization of our own things. We're not going to commercialize everything, but we are, we are trying it out because we feel it's important for us uh, to also do what we preach. Um, so Spotify uh, started the product called Backstage. It has been donated to the CNCF, um, but we still do the majority of the work on it. For those who don't know Backstage, Backstage is a framework for developing internal developer platforms. You can keep all your applications and services and, and whatever else is interesting to be a developer in there. Um, so we've used it heavily inside of Spotify for the last yeah, five years. And it has been a, a success from an open source perspective. We have over 400 adopters, companies who have adopted Backstage now, 1,500 contributors, uh, a lot of folks, a lot of contributions from, from the community as well. If we look at it from the insides, we have around 40 people working full-time on Backstage. There's now a Backstage organization, and they put uh, yeah, 40 full-time uh, positions into this project. Uh, that means both building on the open source version, making sure we move more and more features from the inside into the outside. Um, but we also need to have a path towards sustainability. Again, we have these more uncertain economic times now, and we cannot continue having 40 people working on this without any tangible benefit from it. Uh, of course, we get some branding and hiring benefits from it, uh, but that does not justify 40 full-time positions for Spotify. So we need to find another way. We want to make this a sustainable project, and we actually want to uh, commercialize on top of it so we can stay engaged with the open source project. So we can stay as engaged with, with the open source bits now, but we actually have a commercial strategy for paying some of these people inside of our teams um, so we can be this, do this long term. Um, so the, basically for us, the bet here is, or the model for this is that it'll be a freemium model there's a commercial bundle up top on the open source core. The core will stay open source. The core will stay with the CNCF. We'll continue maintaining it and investing in it. Uh, but at the same time, we'll actually get revenue streams in from these commercial activities that we're putting on top of it. Um, at the same time, we also want to enable revenue from other people in this ecosystem. We can see there's, there's a plugin model for Backstage, and we do want to enable that other people can actually charge for their plugins. We don't feel that having everything for free by default is the right path forward for folks. We feel that there should also be ways for maintainers to make money uh, on top of this ecosystem. Uh, in the end, this is to make our own investment in backstage self-sustainable over time. So um, we want to keep investing to make backstage as good as it can be for the open source one and for commercial features, it's like role-based uh, authentication. It's like these like more, you can say, enterprise driven features we want to put on top of it so we can sustain our investment. And also we need to build up an organization to do this like long term, both for support, um, sales and so on and so on. That, that requires a lot of funds. So um, to summarize, um, the three things we're doing or the three pillars we have is it's, it's essentially making sure all employ employees have dedicated work hours to do their open source work. Is to make funds available for our dependencies like third parties who actually need Support, we want to make sure that they have uh, funds. Um, and then the last one is commercialization. We want to support open source commercialization, both by actually paying commercial projects that we depend on, but also enable other projects to commercialize on top of Backstage. And of course, the last one is we also want to commercialize Backstage to make it sustainable. So it's not just a vanity project, not just something we're doing <laughs> until people think it's not fun to spend 40 people a month on something that doesn't have a tangible benefit. Um, and if you think about it, like ensuring that you have funds, ensuring that you have time, and also ensuring that you have some, somewhat of a, a financial or a commercial model for your work, that's, that's all very normal considerations for any kind of work but open source. Uh, but for us, we feel that it's, it's time to try to change that and ensure that you can, you can participate in open source without spending your nights and weekends that you don't need a second job to pay the bills and that you also, that we can actually create like independent self-sustainable business instead of depending on venture capital and building unicorns and all that. Um, so I think we can still be very passionate about open source, but in the end, um, like open source is just work and that can be work that you are paid for as an independent maintainer or that you get time to do. Um, maybe it's work that turn into careers or businesses. And I think, um, for Spotify as a, a tech company, highly engaged and also benefiting from open source, we have, a, we have an obligation to make sure that happens. 
So thank you very much for, for listening. There's a, a number of ways you can you can reach me if you have any questions. I think we also have time for questions right now. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, it's very interesting to know what Spotify is doing uh, uh, with open source. Uh, contribute and support. So my question um, would be about the uh, uh, project which uh, Spotify is trying to like uh, support by mm, I don't know budgeting or funding. And uh, I know that uh, uh, in this case there is a risk that uh, the developers or owners of those projects would be um, would feel um, obliged or uh, become dependent on the uh, company funding. So how can you tell a few words about this? Yeah, we, we, we thought about it. It was a risk and a consideration also when we decided to go with a larger sum of money. Uh, and uh, we tried to do, make it clear in the communication to the Owners, that this is a sum of money you get no strings attached. It is a one-time fund. We might fund you again next year, but make sure, just so you understand, this is a one-time fund, no strings attached. This is actually payment for work already done. We see you have maintained this for years, and that's actually what we're paying you for. Not to add features, not to do support, not to do presentations. Of course, we, we love that we have a contact with you as a project, but we are paying for work already done. Uh, so it sounds like a donation. Sorry? Uh, so it sounds like a, more like a donation. Yeah, and that's, I think that's the only way we can kind of get into this like neutral thing. But if for us, it's, we know that there's a, there's a, there's a power balance or uh, imbalance. Uh, we are a big company and they're like maybe a one or two uh, people project. Um, and yeah, it is, it, is in, in, it, in, it is a donation. But for us, it's also for us to see them as a vendor we would rather treat them as a vendor relationship, and sometimes a vendor do need to pay, get paid to to, uh, to deliver a quality product. Um, so we don't like we don't like this like idea of donations because it, it seems like it then puts projects in the mindset that they have to kind of depend on the goodwill of, of the richer people in the in the ecosystem, which I think is the wrong way of doing it. Like they're providing something of value, and we are paying them for it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I really uh, agree with your slide about the open source work is prioritized on equal term to core business work. So my question is, uh, as a perspective of OSPO, I agree with this, but as the other person, like a senior levels or business levels, they kind of uh, want me to s calculate some numbers so how do you, how did you uh, persuade to get budgets or something like uh, uh, explanation? Yeah. Um, so it's a very individual thing for each like company, how they actually get value out of, of, uh, of open source. Uh, I think for us, it has been uh, a good driver for hiring. So that has value and we can justify that uh, for instance, our research team re uh, releases quite a lot of like uh, both papers and, and open source code because it does show like these are the interesting things that we are working on and can attract like new hires. Um, you could say hiring is not as big of a priority now as it was before, but it, it is still like an important thing. That, that shows value. Um, then of course your challenge is not supposed to kind of show that doing open source actually helps on your hiring. Um, so but hiring and branding is, is quite up there. And then, for the team that is releasing a project, if they actually can benefit from having outside contributions or getting their project adopted by another company that helps them make it more resilient, that's also something we're seeing. We're seeing like we have some different projects for data pipelines and so on that, that other companies have, have adopted. And there we do get contributions back that makes our own code more resilient. But it's very much individual down on like what, what does your company do and want to achieve with this. What does the, the team do and how can they benefit from it? And then the last one, like how can the individual benefit from it as well? Because I think you can also make a case that says, 
we have a junior engineer here. He's built like a library, a feature library, and wants to open source it so he can actually try to both interact with the open source community, get that experience, and also build up like skills for progressing in his career. And from like a retention perspective, or like you want to keep your employees and, and make them grow, that can also be valuable. Uh, but of course, you can you need to find the justification. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you.